John Pearson, uh, I'm sure some of you are familiar with John. I hope you've had the pleasure of uh, hopping on and listening to him present in the past. Um, John, it looks like uh, you've been here for a short period of time. Very, July, right? yes, just recently. Like 24th, 24th year. Yeah, that's right. First, first toddler <laughs> ever hired. <laughs> uh, that's amazing. Um, and you started here with what you would describe as as kind of a job coach, yes, right? Yes, uh, the, the official title was vocational technician. Okay. And I'm so old, I found the ad in the newspaper. And so the new staff, like the younger new staff here, they uh, they don't even... They can't even comprehend that sound of <laughs> actually yeah, answer an ad in the newspaper, but that's how I found QLI um, back in 1997, 96, 96, 96. Yeah. That was a good year. That was a good year. Uh, so, and, and what was, so if you can maybe describe briefly kind of your, your projection throughout the company or kind of your, your path throughout the company that has led to where you at. To yeah. You at so, today, so, you know, I really did stumble into QLI and I had uh uh, finished my bachelor's. I got a, a the, the joke is I got a BS from BSU, Bemidji State University up in northern Minnesota. And I was just looking for a job. And I, I found QLI and uh, gosh, you know, it's been 24 years. So I started out as a job coach and doing some vocational things with, uh, with our clients. And then I had an opportunity to go into what we were, what we call the dimension three area of uh, it's the one side of our triangle, which is really just helping our, our folks find hope and purpose. That became uh, what we call life path. And we're going to talk about that today. So, you know, really proud. And it's not something that um, I'm taking credit for, but that went from me being the only person in that, in the, on that team, in that department. And now there's probably 25, 26 folks that are, yeah, that's that amazing. That. So, yeah. Um, and now, now you have, as, as everyone can see from the, the title uh, slide, uh, a, a title of Director of Creativity. Um, and there's a joke on campus that's probably the coolest uh, title that anyone's yeah. heard. So I'm always afraid somebody's going to introduce me and say, do something creative you know, <laughs> like, yeah, on the spot. Uh, so that really, just about three years ago, I have a passion for photography. And um, really, I realize it's not just photography, it's storytelling. And I just think the best way to actually really sit with someone and really absorb who they are and, and what's important in their life is to learn their story. So we're pretty fanatical about not only getting those stories from the people we serve, but also teaching the art and the skill, because it really is a skill of, of storytelling too, so that we can go out and um, kind of relay these remarkable stories of the people that we serve. So absolutely, and I think that's a huge, a huge component of that storytelling. Obviously, in, in the vein of this presentation, is the the emotional side of individuals' recovery journey. Um, and so, with that being said, I think I'm going to pass it over to you and let you take the show from here. Um, and we'll go. Yeah, 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 it's great, and I love the uh, conversational side. So jump in, anybody here? We've got Taylor here too. So Taylor, shout if you've got something. Yeah, wait, real quick, John. Um, I know I'm, I'm introducing. I, I actually have not done a fantastic job of, of introducing Taylor. So there's a lot of back end stuff that goes on with these uh, webinars and Taylor is definitely the face of that. So when you guys like are receiving your, yeah, she is the wizard. When yeah. you're receiving your, uh, your CE certificates, your, your email uh, shortly after that's all, that's all Taylor. She handles all that. So a big shout to her. Thank you. Thank you for doing that. That's awesome. And yeah, I, I uh, thank you all for uh, tuning in. Uh, these are always a lot of fun. Um, before I've got my BS from BSU in psychology, I was actually a broadcasting major. So I always feel like this is a, a way to live out that fantasy to be on the, <laughs> be on the radio. So if I, if I go into a radio voice like this, you'll know why. Um, but let's, let's start with, I want to talk and I won't tell the full story just, um, just because of, uh, for the sake of time. But um, I want to tell the story about a remarkable woman named Rachel. And um, I'm going to go back to the year 2013 when Rachel was 19 years old. She was in between her freshman and sophomore years of college. She had transferred from the University of Nebraska at Lincoln and moved back in with her parents for some additional support. And Rachel has always been a, just a, an amazing person. She, she made a typical 19-year-old impulsive decision. But it wasn't a decision that was fueled by reckless abandon or rebellion or drugs or alcohol. Rachel actually, after a long shift of work at Panda Express on a summer evening, she decided that she was going to spontaneously drive six and a half hours and go and see her friend Cassandra, who had had surgery earlier that week. Rachel didn't tell anyone that she was going. She didn't tell Cassandra 
and she didn't tell her parents. She was afraid that her parents wouldn't let her go. Even though she was 19, she decided she was an adult and she hit the road at about two o'clock in the morning. And that's really where I want to start the story. And we'll use just Rachel as just a really a shining example of this emotional recovery. So we'll start the story an hour east of Omaha as um, kind of the exhilaration and the adrenaline rush of, of taking off and making this trip has worn off. And now Rachel is driving a dark um, stretch of highway an hour away just into her trip. As the tires of her 1997 Chrysler LHS drone along the lonely stretch of interstate, Rachel becomes drowsy. Her eyelids feel heavy and her head drops. She jerks awake and sees that her car has completely veered into the left lane. Rachel manages to steer, in, steer back into the right lane and she shakes herself awake. Despite telling herself she's okay, minutes later, it happens again. This time, the car drifts completely across the passing lane. Again, Rachel wakes in a jolt. She overcorrects and veers suddenly to the right. This time, she's lost control of the car. At 70 miles an hour, Rachel smashes through a guardrail. Her car goes airborne as it sails down an embankment. The noise of the vehicle as it impacts the ground is a sound she will never forget. It's a deafening roar of grinding metal and crunching glass. Rachel is thrashed violently inside the interior of the car, but the seatbelt holds. Her head hits the roof as the car rolls two times and lands upright on all four wheels. She's stunned but awake. Now, the only sound she hears is the dirt settling, the ticking of the car, and a dripping sound inside that she realizes is blood coming from a wound on her head. Rachel is instantly aware that something else has tragically changed. She looks down at her legs and thinks they may as well be a part of this broken car. She knows she is paralyzed. Despair is suddenly replaced by panic. Rachel fears the car may be on fire, and in the movie she's seen, when a car's on fire, it's not, it's not long before it explodes. She now has an overwhelming urge to get out. Rachel tries to lift her left arm to unbuckle her seatbelt, but it barely moves. She attempts to reach for the keys in the ignition to restart the mangled car with her right arm, but it's even weaker than the left. She tries to scream, but she can only muster a raspy whisper. After several minutes of intense effort, Rachel has managed to raise her left arm. She rests the back of her hand against the center of the steering wheel in an attempt to honk the horn, but she can't even begin to apply enough pressure. Exhausted, her limp hand flops back into her lap. Rachel hears a car coming towards her on the interstate. She prays, please stop, please stop. The car approaches, then drives by. As she listens to the engine fade into the night, she feels a rush of anger. How can you not stop? How can you leave me here? Then a soft, quiet, and persistent new voice presents itself, and it comforts her. The voice says, Rachel, they can't see you. It's dark. You're in a ditch. If they could see you, they'd stop. You would stop if you were them. Several minutes later, another car approaches. Rachel again prays, please stop. But this time, as the vehicle drives by, she forces a smile and whispers, I hope you're going somewhere special like I was. I hope you have a great life. I'm going to end the story there. Um, I've told that story countless times and rehearsed it, and it, it gets to me every time. You guys know the rest of the story. Um, after Rachel was found by a state trooper, five hours later, which was just remarkable. I mean, she she fought to stay awake because she had heard that if you've had a concussion and she was afraid that maybe she had a concussion, that if she fell asleep, she might not wake up again. And she um, managed to stay awake until a state trooper found her. A, a, actually, a semi-truck driver had seen the guardrail and it was light enough at that time to see that someone had crashed and he called 911. So the, the rest of the story, again, you guys know, jaws of life, life flight, intensive care, long hospitalization, inpatient, acute hospital rehab. And then she comes to QLI. And that's when I first met Rachel. And I remember, I didn't know the vivid details of the story that I just, that I just told you. I've, I've, I've pestered her over the years because I just wanted to, to, to feel um, what it was like to be in that car with her. 
and she's she's been so forthcoming and with sharing her story and i'm really thankful for that but when i first met her i met her in her coffee shop here at qli and we just sat down and started to talk about life and it was several weeks after her injury and she had just gotten out of uh, an acute rehab setting and we were doing um there's rachel didn't even show a picture of her here's another of her graduating so what we were doing is really what we call a life path assessment and sitting and sitting down with Rachel and talking about her life. And I had asked her, you know, before your injury, what were you, what were you hoping for your life? What was motivating you? What was driving you? And I distinctly remember her getting quiet. And she said, after a while, she said, well, before my injury, I wanted to be a nurse. And she looked down at her legs and she looked down at her hands resting on the arms of her wheelchair and her head dropped. And I thought, oh gosh, I've, you know, I've made her feel sad. I've made her think about everything that she's lost. And she looked up at me and she smiled and she said, but now that this has happened to me, I think I'm in, I, I thought about why I wanted to be a nurse and I wanted to be a nurse because I wanted to help people. And I'm not so sure that I can physically be a nurse because that's a pretty physically demanding job. But because of what's happened to me, I think I'm in a better position to help people now than before. And I want to work with kids who have gone through injuries like mine. And to me, that is an amazing example of someone uh, doing what, what our goal is for everybody here. And that's, that's helping them with this emotional component of recovery. And how do you adapt? How can you adapt to a change, a change that you didn't ask for, that you didn't want, that was thrust upon you. And Rachel is just a really good example, and we'll, we'll allude to her throughout the presentation. I've also found it really fascinating. How do you explain, you know, spinal cord injury is really interesting because brain injury, stroke, even chronic pain, they're all so uniquely different, and so are folks with spinal cord injuries. But Rachel's had a complete C5 level spinal cord injury. If any one of us in this room had that same injury, the physical effects would virtually be the same. I think it's so fascinating to take a look at one person who's had the same level injury and they respond the way Rachel has. They're not happy it's happened. They wish it didn't. They mourn. They grieve. They have dark times. But there's something in them that finds a reason to keep moving, a reason to keep moving forward. That, that ultimately someone like Rachel makes an opportunity out of the biggest adversity in her life. And then you take someone else with the same in injury and they won't get out of bed. Understandably, they just feel like their life has been taken from them. How do you explain the two? And I think this is why I abandoned broadcasting and went into psychology because I think that's so fascinating. What, what is the difference? And if you could find the difference and you could incorporate that in your program. I think that's gold. And so that's really what we've tried to do here is figure out what is the difference between those two. And, and there's lots to explain it. Obviously, their upbringing, education, their family dynamics, their friendship circle, their age, their culture, all of those things are important, obviously. But those are things that are beyond our control. We're going to talk today about things that are within our control. Um, and that's really what, what we were doing when we sat down with Rachel and, and did this life path assessment. So here's some of the components to that. So when we sit down with somebody, again, the number one thing is that they trust us and that they know that when I sit down with somebody, I am genuinely invested in your success. I will celebrate your success and we want you to be happy and successful in life. And again, that goes back to that storytelling. The best way is what's their story. And I'm not talking about, tell me about how you're, you were injured. To me, Rachel's story isn't her injury. It's how she's responded to that injury um, and who she is and what she values. I want to, I'm really a pest and because I think again, um, I love stories. So I want to know what did your life look like before your injury? I want a vivid picture of what that path looked like before this event derailed that. And we're going to talk about values over goals, but what is it that's most important? And it sounds like a bumper sticker. The most important things in life aren't things, they're people. And so typically 
people will talk about these are the people that are most important. Injuries, catastrophic injuries, especially can change those roles. And that is a huge adjustment for people. This one, I know a lot of you folks know really well. I mean, if we could only just treat the injury in isolation, that would be a lot easier. But what happens is we get, we get folks, we treat the whole person. And so I know Tim earlier, you were talking about um, a case of somebody that had a brain injury on top of being bipolar. And as much as we'd like to say, well, we're only going to treat the, the brain injury here. We're, we, uh, we, the whole package comes with us, um, to us. So you can't ignore those pre-existing obstacles, whether it be a psychological or somebody who had um, an alcohol addiction or poor family dynamics, those things come with the whole package. So it's really treating a person over just the injury. And also just obviously, how, it, how are they doing now? When we meet them, how do you feel like this injury has impacted you? How are you coping right now? And the biggest predictor of how someone's going to cope after an injury is how they coped with adversity in the past. And we're probably in a position where we're going to be needing to give them new tools um, to respond to this biggest, biggest adversity. And then um, really just then this is the thing that's like the crystal ball. I mean, I always say around here, I wish there's two things I wish we had is, is a crystal ball so we could predict the future. And the main thing is a magic wand. I wish we could just, we could just make this go away. Um, but we can't. So our goal is to not just think about today, but really what is the plan for you to be happy and successful and for your family to be in the best position after you leave QLI. And that and we'll talk about that passing the torch and that involves really just being invested in that future too. Real quick, John, the, the, the first part of that, the establishing the trusting relationship, um, is that something that a majority of folks right off the bat are, are, are open to? Or I mean, that you know, you mentioned Rachel sharing her story, how often does that take a few weeks, a few days, a few, you know, what does that look like typically? So I, I, I've been blown away. So I, you know, I love storytelling. I love photography. So I, we've done countless stories where I will follow someone around and photograph them. I have photographed people in their bedrooms. I mean, you know, to a point obviously, but I mean, in <laughs> not that, not that close, but I mean, I've photographed people in, in very, um, personal and private times, you know, um, and just said, look, we want to, we want to share your story. Mm -hmm. I've, I can't think of maybe but one person in 24 years that said, no, I, I don't want my story told. And so I think I would love to take credit of that for that. But I think the ground has been laid with people that they've met and seen the culture here and they trust us. So I feel like not that there can't be barriers to that, but I've been always amazed at how many people are open to actually having their story told. It's, it's just remarkable to me. Um, it really is. It blows me away that how many stories we're able to tell without people saying, no, I'd rather yeah. not. I'd rather keep that private. So yeah, it's pretty, pretty remarkable. Um, okay. So this one, Tim's going to keep me on track because I could spend the whole time on one slide. There's an old blues song. So in addition to photography, I love blues music and play blues harmonica. And, and so there's an old blues song called You Don't Miss Your Water Until Your Well Runs Dry. And I love that saying because it's really about things that we take for granted. And there's lots of things that I realize working in this job for so long that in life that we do take for granted. One of the things is um, work, the world, the world of work. And I know that if I walked around downtown Omaha at five o'clock and went up to folks and said, hey, I got a deal for you. If I told you that you never had to work another day of your life, they'd probably interrupt me. The vast majority of people would interrupt me and say, sign me up. You mean I wouldn't have to work again? And it's one of those things that I feel like because maybe we have to do it, it, it we feel like work is a burden. When you ask people, how do they like their job? They kind of shrug their shoulders and say, it's a living, it's a paycheck. You know, I hate Mondays. Thank God it's Friday. But when it's taken away, and when I do those life path assessments, I would say that the vast majority of people that I talk to, when they talk about what they want to get back to in life, they talk about work. And they were the same people that would have said, sign me up before their injury. And it's really one of those things that, that I do think we take for granted. Work provides us so much. It provides us with 
a place to be, a routine, a schedule, friendships, um, a sense of purpose is probably the biggest thing. And, and it also is pride and in, in providing for yourself or your family. It's, it's really important. And I think the vast majority of us take it for granted. And we like to bellyache about it and think our lives would be so much better if we didn't have to do it. But the people who are in a position where they can't do it anymore, they want it back. Now, I was born on a Tuesday. It wasn't last Tuesday. I know that doesn't fit everybody, especially if you're in the workers' comp world. There are people who say they want to go back to work and they don't really, I get that. Um, but I'm just talking about the vast majority. But even for those people, this blue 8.8, .8, that's the number of hours on, on a typical day that the average American spends. So when someone's not working, look at that chunk of time and that void that they have in their life. And regardless of whether you're striving to get back to work or you're like, hey, I'm, you know, I don't want to go back to work, that time is going to get filled with something. And I think at the very least, it may be sitting, on, sitting in the recliner with a remote control in your hands, watching TV all day at the very least. At the very worst, it's surrounding yourself with the wrong people, um, giving you bad advice. Maybe it's drugs, alcohol, who knows what, what it could be. But we just know that if people are not filling their time surrounded by the right people and with a strong sense of purpose, it's gonna be problematic. So I think it's really important when we're talking about this life path to get people, it may not be back to work, but getting them back to a sense of purpose, a place to be, and, and to feel pride again in their, in their life. It's a really important part of the Life Path program. Okay, this is another one. I know Tim knows I could. I'm going to let you get on your high horse on this one. Oh, yeah. Get on your, get on your, yeah. So culture, I feel like is such a buzzword in the, especially in the leadership world, everybody's talking about culture. To me, sometimes it's like, it's like the weather. Everyone's talking about it, but nobody's doing anything about it. So everybody knows, yeah, you got to have a good culture. You got to have a strong culture. You got to have a strong culture. And I think that's important at any business that you go to. I don't know, gas station, insurance agency, go across the street here at Target. It, it's really important to have a strong culture for lots of reasons. At QLI, it's non-negotiable. So again, if you think about someone who moves in here, who believes that they've lost everything in their life because of an unexpected, unwanted, catastrophic injury, we have the most reluctant customers in the world. Nobody asks to come to a place like QLI. They have to. Um, hopefully they want to and they've chosen that, but they wish that the circumstances, they, they didn't have those in their life. So they come to us and I always imagine, um, and we all have horrific customer service stories at restaurants or, or retail shops. I had one last week um, that I would love to tell the story, but it's not enough time. But just a, obviously a waitress that didn't want to be there and was incredibly rude. Um, and, I think about, and I think about why that fires me up so much. And it's because I, I think about QLI and I imagine somebody who, who's living here who feels like they've lost everything in their life. And what if we had a staff member that didn't want to be here? And how would that impact their life? And it just, it's not okay. So what we have to have is people who want to be here. And I think that it's not a throwaway because, you know, if people are looking at a place to place someone in a, in a healthcare setting, I'm not sure that this question is asked at all or certainly not enough. Tell me about the culture of your facility, of your center. Because if the staff members don't want to work there, why in the world would anyone, or anyone want to receive services from them? It's non-negotiable. The only thing that might get that person out of bed in the morning that, that feels like they've lost everything is a smiling, positive, encouraging person who they know is genuinely invested in their success. Sometimes that's it. They just, they don't, they don't see the purpose. They don't see that motivation. And sometimes it's us that, um, that gets them kickstarted. So I know I could go on and on. Culture, I know it's a buzzword. It is not, it is not a throwaway here. It is non-negotiable. I feel like it's the palette that everything else is painted upon. And it's really, really important. Um, it's really mentoring and role modeling is what it is. Because what we're trying to do is get people to see 
that um, you can have a more optimistic and hopeful view on life. Um, now you got to be careful. You don't do that. Um, you know, you don't tell people you've got to look on the bright side or you haven't lost everything. I mean, that's not what we do, but just, just the nature of the backdrop of our environment is, is really critical. All right, Tim, you want me to keep going on that or move on? <laughs> I think you can move on. I think you can <laughs> So talking about, uh, things that we take for granted, um, you know, we talked about work and, um, Another thing, you would think 24 years I've worked here, you would think that every single morning when I get up and get out of bed and I stand up and I start to move, after a couple of steps, you would think that I would stop and I would look down at my legs and say, I'm so grateful. I'm so thankful that I can walk. I didn't do it this morning. I didn't do it yesterday. And I probably won't do it tomorrow, unless I think about this webinar. And I think it's so profound that when I visit with somebody who's had a spinal cord injury, a severe spinal cord injury, and they're unable to walk, and you ask them, tell me about your goals, what do you want out of this program? Sometimes they'll look at you like you're crazy and say, I, I want to walk. What do you mean? What do I want to do? Well, they were just like me before their injury. They would get up and walk and they never thought anything about it. And it was something that we, we all take for granted. But I insist that the goal may be walking, but that's not really what's important. And so if I, again, have a really good relationship with somebody, I might say something like, you know, I've worked here a long, long time and I've met a lot of folks that are in similar situations to you, but I can never say I know what it's like, but I can only imagine that if I wasn't able to walk, I imagine that would be a driving force for me too. Can I ask you a question? If you were able to get out of that chair and walk just as strongly as you could before your injury, what's the first thing that you would do? And it, whatever they tell me, that's really the goal. That's really what motivates them. And depending on who the person is, I don't know what they'll say. They may say, oh my gosh, I have a five-year-old son. And the thing that before my injury, he loved to do the most was to play trucks on the floor. And I would get down and I would play trucks with my son. Or maybe somebody would say, I'm a welder and I'd go back to work. Um, everybody's different. But whatever it is that they say, that's really what they miss. It's not the walking. Walking is the what, but what we're trying to find is why, who, and really the what is what motivates you, what drives you. And obviously we want to help them get back to walking. But in the meantime, you know, it's amazing how so many people foreclose or they, or they, uh, what they'll do is put a moratorium. They'll say, you know, I'll play trucks with my kid when I'm out of this chair and I'm walking instead of saying, well, what if we brought the trucks up onto the table, right? That doesn't mean you're giving up on the goal of walking, but let's don't give up on life while you're working on that. And so that's a huge, I think a, a really important part of the Life Path program is, is not just looking at the what. I want to walk. I want to speak. I want to use my hands again. I want to drive. Why? And again, there's a I think there's an old sales technique called the five whys to really get at what, what is important to somebody. And I think that's a, that's a really a good, a good philosophy. Just be nosy and say, why? Tell me why and get to what, what's most important. Okay. <laughs> there's Taylor. In case you're wondering what Taylor would like to say, she's the uh, magic eight ball there. And that is our neuropsychologist, uh, Dr. Dr. Snell in the llama head, right? Who I'm sure a lot yeah. of the folks on today have heard speak <laughs> multiple times. I'm sure you'll really <laughs> love that we threw that, that we threw that in there. Um, and uh, there's, there's a few slides on here that I'm not going to go deep in the weeds uh, because I know uh, Dr. Snell goes uh, definitely deep in with cognitive behavioral therapy and, and ACT, acceptance commitment therapy. So I know he does presentations on that. So those would be more of a, just a teaser for that. Um, 
but you know, this is a great picture. It shows our culture, right? And this shows um, Dr. Snell around here isn't, you know, he's Dr. Snell when he needs to be, but it, uh, if any of the employees go up and say, good morning, Dr. Snell, he immediately says it's Jeff because he's, he knows that he's part of a team and he ties his ego to the success of the whole versus tying his ego to his education or his, the letters behind his name. Um, he's, he's a remarkable guy. But again, back to that culture and what does it do? Well, it, it's really about understanding that happiness is something that, that can be role modeled and it can be learned. And so this is a, a bit of a book uh, recommendation, uh, an author named Sean Acor, and it's positive psychology. And I think, um, I know when I read it, I was like, okay, positive psychology, that's what, got to look on the bright side, got to be happy. The, the book is really interesting and it, it supports our belief in neuroplasticity. We are, we are, you know, I said, we're fanatical about storytelling, uh, especially our CEO, Patricia Kern. She's fanatical about learning and she is a firm believer. And I subscribe to this, that there really is no such thing as talent isn't a gift. It is, it is a skill. And so if you want to be a great presenter, you want to be a great storyteller, you don't look at somebody who does that well and say, ah, oh, well, they have a gift. I'm, I'm no good at that. Well, how they don't have a gift. They learned it. They learned it through passion, through the right mentoring um, in the right environment. And so you can virtually anything around here. If you, see some, if you see somebody who's talented at something, they worked at it and it's a skill. So this book really subscribes to it. And, and not only do you work at it, your brain rewires itself and, and through learning and, and uh, neuroplasticity, you can become skilled at just about anything, including being optimistic. I read somewhere, I don't think it's in this book, um, an interesting theory that humans are wired to be more pessimistic because it wasn't that long ago, just a few centuries even, that that kept us alive. If we were constantly on alert for bad things to happen, well, those are the people that survived. Could be a lightning strike, could be an invasion from a marauding uh, neighboring village, um, you know, a flash flood, a rattlesnake jumping out. I mean, those people who are on constant alert for bad things to happen, they survived. And the echoes of that remain. And so while there's um, probably not a marauding villager that's going to come into this room right now, when something that happens unexpected, we can sometimes go to the negative. And this book is all about rewiring your brain, again, through learning and neuroplasticity to actually respond towards the optimistic side. And um, it's just, a, I won't go much longer than that, but it's really about um, shaping and learning how to have a more optimistic viewpoint, which is really the goal, not only for the clients that we serve and our, and our families, but um, for all of us. Again, when we talk about emotional recovery and our life path, um, this is all rooted in um, cognitive behavioral therapy, and QLI was founded by Dr. Kim Hogamine, who's a clinical psychologist and he's a behaviorist. So we use a lot of these strategies that we're talking about, not only in our clinical program, but also with our leadership model. And I'm not going to go long into this, but in the early days, I'll go back there, the behaviorists believed that we were at the mercy of our environment, our stimulus that happens. Something would happen and there'd be a response the cognitive behavioral therapist came along and said, well, again, like I, like I was talking about with Rachel, how do you explain two people that have the same situation, maybe that spinal cord injury that has the same physical effects, and the response is different? Well, the difference is what happens in between the stimulus and the response is something that happens between our ears. And those are our individual core beliefs. Those core beliefs can serve us really well. They can be super healthy. They can be super rational. Or oftentimes they can trip us up and they can provide a, an obstacle to our success and our happiness. And those are irrational belief systems. We'll talk a little bit about those. And these belief systems um, really shape our emotions, our thoughts, our judgments, and our behaviors. So what we're trying to get at is we know for our, for our residents and our clients that we serve, the stimulus is this unexpected injury how do they respond is really based upon their beliefs. So here's some, here's some common irrational belief systems um, 
that can happen again in that in the middle between the stimulus and the response. I always think about we were talking about uh, before we not, we went on air today about public speaking, and I think that's a great one to just step outside it, um, um, from a clinical side um, to talk about that public speaking is is always fascinating to me. Um, you know, I've I've heard I don't know if there's any accurate studies. I can't believe this is true, but um, the number one fear of Americans is public speaking, which means people fear it more than death, which is kind of amazing. So Jerry Seinfeld had a joke that said, when you go to a funeral, you'd rather be the poor schmuck in the casket than, than the guy delivering the eulogy. Um, and people are terrified of it. They're absolutely terrified. And I get it because it, it, it's just, it gets at the core of what we were talking about, about our individual core beliefs. And if you think about it, you know, this webinar, for example, this may be going really bad. You may be, you may be sitting there and just saying, this is horrible. This is really a bad presentation. And if I knew that, and maybe I'll get that through the feedback, right? Um, you know, that's like- I think a, it's going great. Oh, thanks, Jim. Yeah, you have to say that, right? Um, I just think that's fascinating. So, so why don't people do public speaking? Well, it's the what ifs. Well, 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 wait a minute. What if? What if? What if I got up there and I I froze? Oh, I forgot. I forgot my notes. What? If, what if? What if it's really bad? What if it's it's horrible? Nobody 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 responds to it. What if it's just really really bad? What if? Now this could happen. I know it sounds crazy, but what if? What if my heart races so so much and 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 I start to feel dizzy and I faint and I throw up on myself and I fall and I and I go on the ground. Like what that could happen. I've heard it. I've, that's happened before. What if, right? And so let's say I was at a presentation and that actually happened. Um, usually I'm presenting it, you know, in a healthcare setting. So there's probably 20 nurses there to come up and help me, right? <laughs> so and and really what would happen? I, I might be mortified of like, oh my gosh, I can't believe that I threw up on myself and fainted and they had to stop the presentation. The truth is everybody in attendance. By the time, if that was at 10 o'clock in the morning, by the time you go to lunch, you're going to be more concerned about what you're having for lunch than the poor dude that threw up on himself and passed out, right? I mean, it's just, it's just true. And so, you know, there's another blues song. I think it's uh, called Nobody Loves Me But My Mama, but she might be jiving too, right? So it's just like, when you come to this realization that the world doesn't think about you as much as you really think, it's a little humbling, but it's ultimately super super freeing. Catastrophizing is you not only what if, what if, but that's even taking it a step further. I threw up on myself. What if I were to throw up on myself and I were to pass out because that could happen. And, and, and then, you know, public speaking is a big part of, I'm director of creativity. That's a big part of my job. Storytelling, public speaking. What if I couldn't do that? If I couldn't do that, I couldn't do my job. If I couldn't do my job, then, then uh, I can't pay my, my, my mortgage. And if I can't pay my mortgage, I, I, I won't have a house. I won't have anywhere to live. And if I don't have anywhere to live, I'll probably be having to stay under a bridge and I'll probably get strung out on heroin. And it, like, I mean, people can take this to not only just the, the, the stressor, but then catastrophize into something absolutely ultimately tragic is going to happen in my life because of this. Um, so this is just human nature. Um, you know, I, I always think the, the engine light on when you're driving, your engine light goes on. I think it's fascinating how there can be two responses. One person might be, again, a catastrophizer and say, oh, great. Yep, there it is. That, that means the transition. It's probably going to, transmission's going out. It's probably going to cost, I don't know, $7,000 could be. I don't have $7,000. And again, if I don't have $7,000. Can't, I can't get to work. I won't have a car. If I can't get to work, I'll lose my job. I'll be under a bridge, right? And then there's other people. I think I'm more sometimes prone to this. You're driving along and you see your engine light on. You're like, oh, no, no, don't see that. Don't see that. No, no, I'm sure it'll go off. I'm sure it's nothing, right? If I avoid it, it will go away, it's right? It's just your tires. It's cold outside. It's just yeah, the yeah. tire light, right? Yeah, the tire light, right? <laughs> um, I just think that's, that's pretty fascinating how humans can have two different, two different reactions. Um, you know, and again, just putting it in every day, I think, you know, why me when bad things happen, obviously, when we're talking about the people we serve, that's at a really deep level, but even on a superficial level, this is my brother when we're driving. So when I'm driving with my brother, my oldest brother, and 
Um, it could be, I, I've had this happen on a Sunday when we're just, he's showing me around his neighborhood where he lives and we have nowhere to go. And he's driving and he comes up on a red light and he's like, come on, oh, you gotta be kidding me. Right, every red light, um, he just curses every single red light. And my brother believes that he hits more red lights than anybody on the planet. I think he genuinely believes that the universe is conspiring against him and he hits more red lights. Now, if my brother were here, we would try to teach him that, okay, that's not rational. It, it all evens out. And you know what you could do? When you go through a green light, you could go, woohoo, green light, right? Um, he's not quite to that point, right? Um, and then craving justice. Man, oh man, is this not happening on steroids with social media? I mean, we, we all know you get on Facebook, you get on Twitter, you get on any social media and people are just, we, we now have this tool in our hands and we have our thumbs and we can see something and we can immediately crave justice. We can immediately exact punishment and demand someone pay. Um, it's just happening all over the place. And I think that's just a hardwired, um, I don't know. I don't know. That one's really interesting me to me. I mean, road rage is the great example of that. Someone cuts you off in traffic and you want to make that person pay um, because what kind of a jerk, you know, does that is more is, is it doesn't care about other people behind them. Well, the truth of the matter is, you know, we would all, most of us hopefully would feel differently if maybe you were speeding up next to that car that cut you off and maybe you were thinking about flipping them off and you look in the back seat and you see a, a, a crying woman holding a child that's bleeding, you'd probably change your tune, right? If you just stopped and got more, got the real story. And so, you know, these are all just really common human, um, irrational belief systems that we all can work on. And sometimes it just takes a moment to just stop and think about, is this emotional reaction um, really valid? Or am, am I allowing my emotions to lead my thoughts? Or can I get to a point where I stop and I think, and then I, and then I have emotions after the fact. The goal isn't to have, have, make people unthinking robots. That's not the goal. Um, there are times where, you know, um, we need to grieve and we, we, we're legitimately angry. angry. Um, but that's really the kind of the goal um, with all of this. So, you know, to put it in context with the people that, context with the people that we serve, catastrophizing obviously they've been through a catastrophe but that doesn't mean that further catastrophes have to befall them because of this the the when somebody's in a wheelchair for the first time and they go out in public i've had this happen where people say i don't want to go out in public in this stupid chair everyone will be staring at me and you know what's even worse they're going to be looking at me and they're going to feel sorry for me and again they're all thinking about me. And the truth is there's lots of people out there with wheelchairs and people are more concerned about where they're going than, than really you in that wheelchair. I mean, that's, that's really the truth. And again, if you can help someone arrive at that, here's their alternative too that I've, again, if I have a really good relationship with somebody, I may have them consider the alternative. Let's say you go out, two things. Let's say you go out and someone does stare at you. And let's say that you were a mind reader and you were able to tell that they felt sorry for you. What do you care? That person has no bearing in your life whatsoever. How does that impact you? It only impacts you if you allow it. But let's consider the alternative. What if someone stared at you and instead of feeling sorry, they saw strength? What if they looked at you and said, that's really cool, that this person is not allowing that injury or that illness to keep them at home? They're living their life. That's awesome. Because I think that's what most people actually see. That's what I see when I see somebody out and about. So it's helping people consider the alternative is really important. So those are just some common irrational belief systems. I'm not going to go really deep into this. This is a, another behavioral. And again, Dr. Snell can go into this. This is it's very similar to CBT, but it's much more mind, uh, on, from a mindful perspective. And instead of fighting those irrational belief system, systems, it's more of just, just recognizing them you know, allowing them, recognizing that they're with you, within you and getting more focused on something that you value and, and is productive in your life. 
so the next um, portion really is just a, it's so important. We get, we get people here at QLI and because of our environment, because of everybody that's so invested in, in, you know, the life path and the culture and really shaping an optimistic outlook and attitude, you know, the visual that I have sometimes is when someone comes to QLI, they're like that from an emotional standpoint, they're like that helium balloon that just doesn't have quite enough helium in it to stay afloat um, on its own. And so as they're going throughout their day here, constantly people are just gently lifting them up and keeping them aloft. And it could be a compliment or, oh my gosh, you look so great. Or, you know, you're getting so much stronger or what happened to the power chair? That's awesome. You're using a, a, a manual chair now. Um, could just be good morning. How are you? Good to see you. We have all of these people that are keeping this balloon aloft. And again, that's super important. But at some point, all of these people are going to go away and the person's going to move to a much smaller system. And how is that balloon going to stay aloft? Now, the goal is to refill it with helium so that they can, they can keep it aloft on their own. But we know in life that it's, that, that it's hard to do that all the time on your own. So passing the torch really is a couple of things. It's giving them the strategies because we believe that this is a skill to learn to be more optimistic uh, in life and to see the opportunity. But also we know that who you're surrounding yourself with is really important too. So are our families really in the know with how to help someone be successful and maintain a positive attitude? At the job site, have we been to the job site? Have we talked openly about someone's injury? Have we talked openly about the things that they're working on and, and how coworkers and bosses can be um, helpful with helping them be successful? So this program cannot end with a discharge date and we salute them and say, good luck. Um, there is an intense follow-up and we have to be available um, because likely there's going to be more conflict and obstacles that they're going to face once they get back, get back to, to life and get back to home. So the passing of the torch is, is just a way of saying that it's, it's not done in this finite period here at QLI, and it's not done in a vac vacuum with just the person that we're serving. It's everyone that they're connected to. So it's a really important part that, that when we talk about our follow-up process. Yeah, I think it's also, John, you know, you talk about the, the balloon and, and keeping it aloft. You know, one thing that that our teams here do a fantastic job at, it would be also the family component of that and making sure the whole family is kept aloft, you know, and um, that's that's part of that life path. And, you know, you you kind of challenged everyone about the culture and, and how often you're looking at um, what the culture's like or asking questions about the culture of the facilities individuals are using. You also should figure out really all the components of who's being treated. Um, and, and, and I know, you know, billing structures and things like that limit who can be a part of a program. But for us, you know, we were able to do that based yeah. on, based on our structure. And it's also, it, we think it's a, a incredibly valuable component of somebody's recovery. Yeah, no, I mean, it's, it's not, you know, and I think we've learned that over the years too, that we've always been, you know, customer service wise, really, welcoming to families, but you know, over the years we've realized now the families are part of this program. They have to be, um, cause that's where people are moving back to. So spouses, children, parents, that's just hugely, hugely important. So I know we're running pretty close to time here. So, um, I wanted to finish with where we started with Rachel and, um, Rachel went through our program and was obviously just a, a star and everybody she came into contact with. We'll always remember Rachel. And she's now a, a mentor in our spinal cord injury program. She's racking, wrapping up her second master's degree. Um, so she's pursuing that goal that she told me. Um, again, it's a more of a value helping people, but um, she's doing great with that. And I wanted to, to, to wrap up. I just saw quickly a photo of her graduating with her undergraduate. And we put together a little video and a story on that. And this was. Um, I don't want to call it a risky question, but I really wanted to ask Rachel and that now at that point, it had been a few years since her injury that if she could go back and, and go back in time and, and change that decision of, of getting in the car and driving. Um, I was curious on what her response 
would be. And um, I actually just kind of transcribed what she told me when I recorded her response. And I want to read that. She said, if I could walk again and use my hands again, that would be the best gift in the world. But if I could go back to that day and change what happened, I absolutely would not. Because I've gained so much from it. I've lost so much physically, but mentally, emotionally, spiritually, I've gained more than I can even put into words. And the experiences I've had and the beautiful people who've come into my life and the opportunities that have been created because of what happened, that's something I wouldn't change for the world. That's, that's amazing. And that's really, gosh, if every person and every family that we work with, we could get to them to that point in their recovery, that's, that's really what we strive for. So that's emotional recovery right there in, in one statement to me. All right, Tim, what else? What I forget? Um, nothing, John. I think you did a fantastic. Uh, I didn't fantastic. throw up on myself. There is no. <laughs> it's true. You're still standing. No I'm still standing. So <laughs> sitting. I guess that what if didn't happen. No, um, I, don't, I don't know about the what if. It goes horribly bad, and nobody responds to it. And maybe that's happening. No, I think it was great, John. Okay, um, we did have one question come through, um, and we're going to start the question and answer here shortly. I will. I'll put a poll up here uh, in just a minute. So please stay tuned for that. Um, can you describe? I think one thing that maybe we didn't touch on that would be great for you is, is how life path is incorporated into individuals daily, daily rehab into their, you know, into their daily routines, into their program. What right. It looks like whether it's, yeah. is it a separate component? Is it daily meetings? No, it's meetings? really good. And that's, that's that odd really thing needs to be, you know, the life path, there is a team called life path, but um, I think we've really gotten to the point and we get, we always have growth to do that if you polled any physical therapist, for example, and said, okay, why are you doing what you're doing? Um, you know, the answer, the answer can't be, well, we're trying to increase that range of motion in that uh, upper right extremity from X to Y degrees. Like, you're not going to hear that. It may be, well, you know, they've got a, they've got a two-year-old and she told me that her goal is to be able to lift, lift him, lift um, her two-year-old out of the crib. And so that's why we're working on what we're working on. So yes, it has to be embedded. You have to, again, know the why of what you're doing. So Life Path is not a separate entity. There is a team that just focuses on that, but their goal really is to celebrate and do PR for that person and say, this is what we need to be working on. So everything needs to go towards that, whether it's speech, PT, OT, psychology, it all has to be incorporated into to our program. It's a really good question. And one that I should have touched on that. It's not a separate, it's not an activities department. Like it's not, that's not what it is. It is, it has to be embedded into the fabric of someone's, someone's program. Absolutely. Um, okay. We're going to go ahead and launch the poll question here. So you should see that pop up on your screen here in one second. Um, and as that's going on, please feel free to type questions. I've got the, the question and answer panel up. So we'll be able to see that and talk with John. Um, is there, you know, John, throughout your career here, have you seen life path, um, morph and change and adapt and like, what, what's your vision the next 10 years, the next 24 years, right? I mean, how does that as a provider life path services, um, what does that look like? Um, yeah, that's a good question. I, you know, I think early on, you know, we, we had a recreation department, so I think we thought, well, it was doing recreation and recreation we realize is just a sliver of our lives and what's important to us. I think then it was, I think as we, as we went through the growing pains in this program, we thought, you know, for example, I play harmonica. Well, let's say that I had an injury like Rachel did and, it, and I, I can't even grasp the harmonica and lift it to my lips. And I have now breath control issues. Probably the worst thing you could do if the first day I was here is say, oh, we heard you play har harmonica. Here, let me hold it to your mouth and have you play, yeah. right? That would probably be the worst thing that you could do. So it's not as simple as just saying, oh, they loved this before. Let's, let's, you know, let's have them do it again. Well, what is my emotional reaction going to be to that? Mm -hmm. If we have a, a competitive cyclist now and they need to ride to, to bicycle, they need to do a tandem recumbent bike, there's going to be an emotional reaction to that. So I think life path where we really realize it is just what we're talking about today is that people are responding from an emotional uh, standpoint to, to this. And it's not as simple as, 
just what they like to do before and can we incorporate it? And you mentioned the families. I think that's something that we can continue to grow. I think uh, if Pat were right here, she would be saying learning, 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 yeah. learning. What are we doing to um, change the brain? What are we doing to help people learn a new way of approaching something and be successful at it? Um, so I think that learning is, is something that, and just the, the exciting philosophy of neuroplasticity is, is going to be embedded in everything that we do. Absolutely. And that's something, I mean, not, not new, but as over the last 10 years, I think that the, the science behind that is really yeah. kind of fueled a lot of what we do on that. Well, when I started, well. when I started 24 years ago, and even probably 10 years ago, people were told you got a two year window with a brain injury, especially two year mm -hmm. window. And then after that, it's, you know, plat the plateau word. That's what you'd hear. Well, we've got people at QLI in our, in our residential side that have been here for 30 years going on 30 years and I've seen them. I have known them for a quarter of a century and I've seen them learn and grow and adapt mm -hmm. years after. So, I mean, we just knew that wasn't right, but now with neuroplasticity, there's your evidence that absolutely that it, for sure it's it, people continue to learn and grow. Do we, um, in your, in the infancy of this life path, team life path um, program or even even now um, from the billing side from insurance side of things is there ever any pushback is that something that you know when we're writing programs or we're giving updates to a to a case manager or to something is that something where they're like well we're not we're not paying for that well but, I, I think what you maybe fall into is like yeah, how do you how do you measure this mm -hmm. right so I can measure you are able to ambulate 50 feet last week and this week you did 75 i can predict maybe you'll do 100 next week like, that's very predictable mm -hmm. and and more measurable how do i measure how someone is feeling hope or optimism or sense of purpose or adapting and so it becomes a little harder i think so that can be one of the barriers i feel like you know I don't know. I, I, I think what happens then is it just becomes easier to fund those things that we can see and measure. Well, mm -hmm. I, I, how do I, how do I fund that? And I don't know, I guess I wish people would maybe um, providers would maybe talk to talk to the actual recipients and the families and saying, how are you doing? How are you doing coping with this? They, yep. I know you're getting stronger on a physical side and the medical side, but let's talk about, do you feel like you've got a plan to help you um, cope and adapt and, and you know thrive versus just surviving this so yeah touching on that a little we had a question come through um what are your recommendations for telephonic nurse case managers and establishing that connection that rapport that relationship and i think what you just said right there um it can sometimes be as simple as a conversation but i'm sure there's a lot more uh to that yeah and and i think you know and you know maybe that's one of the barriers too of like gosh i can't spend a whole session of just learning their story Right. I mean, you know, and, and so I think if you're hamstrung by that and you have to jump right in and start doing billable therapy, I think that is going to be a challenge. Right. So, mm -hmm. you know, how can you make that connection is how do you spend time with that person and, and really learn their story? And it's not just their story, but what do they value? What are you missing in your life? Um, what's your definition of success? What would make you happier and spend any therapist spending time um, Doing that, I think, is is huge, and and finding time to do that, and then, like you said earlier, basing your therapy upon that. Everything then goes back to that mm -hmm. because this is their values. This is what's most important. So everything that I prescribe from them from this point forward needs to be tapped into that. Absolutely, for them to ultimately be successful and happy. So, okay, yeah. Well, I think it was great, John.